Uh, my name is Laura Hammond. I'm a professor of development studies at SOAS. Um, it's, real, it's a real honor to be joining you today and to be chairing what I think will be a really interesting, uh, fascinating discussion on mobility, migration, and diaspora. Um, we have three speakers today, and I am going to introduce them uh, as uh, I'll introduce each in depth as, as we go forward. But just to say, we have Professor Kalpan Herala from the University of KwaZulu Natal, uh, Dr. Binia Mizgun from also from the University of KwaZulu Natal, and um, Mr. Onyakachi Wambu, who is the uh, Executive Director of um, African, uh, I always get afford um, the acronym wrong, but the, the African Foundation for, uh, help me out on your catchy, <laughs> for diaspora. No, African Foundation for Development. Exactly, sorry. Actually, I'll, I'll, read, I'll read that better when I, um, when I come to your biography. Um, sorry about that. Um, Wait, I'm getting a bunch of messages here. Here we go. Um, so, the, first of all, we're going to first we're going to hear from uh, Professor Kalpana Heralal, uh, who is a professor of history in the School of Social Sciences at Howard College at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Uh, she teaches both undergraduate and graduate level modules on global history, women, gender, and politics. Her PhD was looking at South Asian diaspora to Africa in settlement trade and identity formation. Um, she has two key areas of interest in gender and South Asian diaspora and women in the anti-apartheid struggle. Her most recent publications are the co-author of Pioneers of, I'm gonna spell this and pronounce this wrong probably, but uh, Satyagraha Indian South African, uh, South African Defy Racist Laws, 1907 to 1914, and the co-author of Gender and Mobility, Borders, Bodies, and Boundaries. Um, she is going to speak on gendered migrations in the political economy of Natal. So go ahead, Kalpana. Okay. Um, thank you, um, uh, Professor Hammond, and thank you to SOAS and UKZN for giving me the opportunity to present this very short paper. So it's titled Gendered Migrations in the Political Economy of Natal. So basically it examines historical migrations within the British Empire with a specific reference to um, Natal in the mid 19th century, uh, where the focus is on, you know, European and Indian women from and India respectively who migrated to Natal in the 19th century, as well as the local uh, urbanization of African women. So the paper actually problematizes and it's very much an exploratory paper um, it kind of problematizes female migration patterns to Natal, but within a comparative framework, uh, arguing that race, class, and gender played a very pivotal role and kind of shape and define the everyday lives of these women. So European women settlers were privileged within the kind of the colonial economy, while Indian and African women suffered triple oppression in terms of their race, class, and gender. So it, a comparative analysis not only highlights the gender dynamics of migration to colonial Natal, but also that migratory experiences um, cannot be in a way centralized or homogenized. And it also helps us to understand the kind of the relationship um, between the oppressed and the oppressors, but more significantly, it also helps us to understand the kind of nuances in the experiences between the oppressed groups particularly in the context of migration, particularly when we look at in terms of, you know, local and international migrations. So in the interest of time, and I only have 10 minutes, I'm just going to run through very uh, four key as four aspects that I would like to highlight, uh, particularly in, in, in trying in, in, in the framework of uh, compar uh, comparisons. So if we look at the first one as reasons for migration, now in all three groups, whether local or international, there were kind of similar reasons for migration shaped by socioeconomic political factors. So British settlers, women settlers, a part of uh, women immigrants were part of a kind of a colonization scheme to entrench British presence in Southern Africa. So between 1849 and around 1851, you had like approximately 5,000 settlers arriving in Natal under the Joseph Bryan scheme. And of course, there were other settlers also that followed, like the German and the Norwegians. 
but that the women were motivated by several factors to emigrate, the impact of the industrialization in Britain, the outbreak of diseases, and a well-run publicity campaign by the Emigration and Colonization Office, which touted colonies as lands of opportunities. Okay. And the, the uh, early British women settlers in Natal were married women, but very few amongst them were settlers. African women during this period were largely confined to the reserves or locations which were overcrowded, impoverished, and devoid of any kind of rich mineral source, and, and became an essential source of cheap mining, uh, a cheap labor for mining capitalists. And these kind of conditions merely exacerbated um, you know, the living conditions of the local Africans. So colonial rule kind of created shifts um, within the uh, rural um, household within rural in, uh, uh, within the, the rural economy and um, not only in the means and the kind of mode of production but also in the sexual division of labor so the agriculture the, the movement of young African men to the mines of the entire migrant labor system um, created um, shifts in agricultural responsibilities for women and the aged in the rural economy. And this had a tremendous implications for the rural household and further kind of exacerbated poverty levels in the reserves. Indentured women on the other hand who arrived in 1860, um, but unlike African and Indian, uh, European uh, women, uh, British women arrived under a contractual system of five years. So at the end of that five years, they could either return to India or re-indenture. Uh, but like settler and African, uh, um, African women, their reasons for migration kind of varied. Uh, poverty, uh, the desire for a better livelihood, and, and, and also consisted of married, single, widowed, and divorced women. The second aspect that I want to look at is labor and employment. So if we do a comparison of all three groups, what, what emerges is that colonial attitudes towards women were gendered and most noticeable in the employment and labor patterns. So settler women on arrival worked in kind of very traditional occupations, such as being a governess, a dressmaker, but not much later, you find that they, um, by the turn of the century, they entered wage labor, working as shop assistants or secretaries or clerks, etc. They became, and I quote, the symbols of the authority and superiority, unquote, of the white ruling class in Natal. And um, they were very much embedded in Victorian notions of domesticity and, and gentility. Urban white women very rarely forged relations with African and Indian women, other than you know, for labor purposes. And African women, on the other hand, frustrated by the limited opportunities in the reserves and the growing levels of poverty, um, sought employment elsewhere. So many of them, for example, worked as farm laborers or domestic servants and nearby white owned farms on the reserves. And they were amongst, and these were actually amongst the lowest paid um, jobs available. So frustrated, some of them actually fled to the mission stations or to the cities. Indentured women on the other hand were kind of seen as adjunct migrants. And in fact, initially they were not very much welcome. They were kind of reluctantly uh, or grudgingly uh, brought to the colony. It was only much later that attitudes towards endangered women kind of changed. And the type of work that they were assigned to, and I quote, were delicate and more inclined to do light, for white, light work, sorry, unquote. Um, and so hence, they were assigned uh, on the plantations, for example, on the north coast of Natal, as agricultural workers, but it was more as field hands on plantations, uh, domestic servants, child minders, and kind of doing surface work on railways and coal mines. Um, the third aspect that I want to highlight is the recruitment procedures. And once again, it reflects colonial attitudes towards women and their role within the empire and how that kind of also shaped by geopolitical, social and economic factors. So settler women were encouraged to migrate to contribute to the colonization in the wake of the British empire. Um, various colonization societies, and there were quite a few at that time, were established to facilitate recruitment and the kind of peddled employment prospects, such as, such as that of being a governess or a nurse. But the hidden agenda was really part of the colonization scheme and also towards colonial marriage and motherhood. For example, 
the Colonial Land and Immigration Board uh, was looking for, and I quote, the right sort of woman that will contribute to colonization in the wake of the British Empire, skilled, intelligent, and domesticated. In other words, the colonialists in Natal were looking for homemakers and homekeepers. Indentured women, on the other hand, came to labor on a contractual system, labor system, to serve the interests of the local capitalists and were recruited by agents that were appointed by emigration agents, both in Calcutta and in Madras, which were the key areas of recruitment. Um, and it was um, recruit, recruiting agents, for example, also touted towns and villages to secure uh, the 40% uh, quota that was required of women immigrants. In the process, um, coercion and deception was prevalent. On the other hand, the urbanization of African women drew resentment from both colonial officials, officials sorry, and local chiefs, the former seeking to control their mobility to the urban areas through legislation, and the latter who kind of sought to exercise a customary a male hold on the women. In the cities, many African women found employment as domestic servants, hawkers, beer brewing, etc. The last aspect that I would look want to focus on is resistance and agency. So, um, African and Indian women, unlike set, uh, British settler women, were subject to numerous disabilities. So, particularly efforts to stem their, you know, mobility um, um, in the urban areas. So, the presence of free Indians. Um, those, for example, who did not renew their endangered labor contracts and stayed in Natal, and the, and, and the gradual urbanization of African women were not particularly welcomed by colonial authorities. And since a series of restrictions were instituted, for example, the passes for African women, the three pound tax on, Indian, on endangered women, um, Indians were bar debarred from hotels, public baths, and so on and so forth state controls to marriage, beer brewing, and social reproduction. But African and Indian women resisted, and this was most noticeable in the anti-pass campaign in Bloemfontein in 1913 and the 1913 Satyagraha movement. Um, so, um, so in conclusion then, um, what I'd like to just highlight is that um, Indian women, Indian indentured women, like the African and African, uh, like the African counterparts, suffered a triple oppression in terms of their race, class, and gender. And despite their oppressed status, there was very little in the way of interracial, social, and political solidarity during the first quarter of the century. Both groups remained largely isolated from each other to some extent, politically and socially. It was only in the 1950s when mainstream political organizations like the African National Congress and the South African Indian Congress, um, and later the Liberal Democrats embraced non-racialism, was there a closer cooperation between Indo-African and white women? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kalpana. That's a fascinating um, account. Um, really, really, really rich. I'm sure there'll be some good um, discussion about that afterwards. I should say that um, if you have questions, there should, there's a, uh, a Q&A um, box down at the bottom of your screen. There should be one. Please enter them in any time. I'm going to hold on the questions until we've heard from all of our speakers and then we can um, refer to them. But if you, if you don't want to uh, lose track of them, please just enter them any time. Um, so now moving to our second speaker, um, Vinia Mizgun who is, as I mentioned, a lecturer of, uh, in the Department of Economic History and Development Studies at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, Viniam's main research interests include migration development and the environment. And he's going to speak today on uh, playing with sameness and difference, ethnography of transnational practices and Ethiopian migrants in Durban. Viniam. Can you think you need to unmute yourself? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Laura. Uh, yes, uh, in this uh, particular project, what I try to do is uh, uh, draw uh, from a broader research on uh, the problematics of integration that we have uh, with, uh, a South in South Africa as a, a transnational space and trying to make sense of uh, how identities uh, 
are weaved in in those transnational uh, spaces uh, with the, as foreign nationals coming in uh, into South Africa. That's what I try to grapple with and consider inter integration as a, a rather as a problematic instead of uh, uh, an outcome uh, which most migration studies have been uh, 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 accustomed to uh, uh, and appropriated it in that way. And here what I what I wanted to do is using ethnography, uh, try to uh, capture how integration is represented in and through the, the everyday. And here uh, two uh, uh, writers have been very influential to my thinking about this. Uh, the one is a Stuart Hall and uh, uh, his uh, uh, description of uh, identities, uh, diasporic identities, as stories we tell about ourselves and others. And uh, uh, for him, uh, that temporary attachment uh, uh, is a very essential element of uh, how he characterized uh, identities. And another author has been very important here is the Michel de Sarto. Uh, particularly his work on strategies and, and tactics, uh, strategies as organized by power uh, in the form of uh, uh, structure, uh, architecture, and then in this case, and I appropriated it to also uh, uh, look at how narratives have been organized by uh, uh, powers. And tactic is how individuals from the law uh, appropriate those uh, uh, challenge uh, power uh, and uh, uh, subvert it and invent new uh, ways of uh, representing themselves and uh, facilitating their interaction. And in the everyday, and the, the everyday has been very central here. Uh, and it's through that I try to make sense of the movements and moments and, uh, 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 and their implication to shifting sense of identity, belonging and community among Ethiopian migrants uh, in South Africa more broadly, but for the purpose of this particular paper, I only selected uh, uh, those who had been living in Durban and ethnographic accounts from uh, uh, from uh, 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 from Durban as a, a particular site for my research. And um, what I what I wanted to uh, to portray here is the fluidity of association, belonging, and sociability, and how power relations uh, continue to regulate who is in, who is out. Uh, uh, and ways of uh, capturing uh, uh, this uh, 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 by exploring the everyday interaction and the everyday conversations that individuals have. And uh, therefore, uh, much of what I uh, present today would be a snippet of the ethnographic accounts, and I hope you'll bear with that. Uh, Ethiopians do, do, uh, did arrive or started uh, arriving in Durban in the early 90s. Uh, though there are accounts that uh, some of them had uh, uh, come to South Africa prior to that, even while apartheid was uh, 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 in full swing. Uh, but much of it uh, is uh, from the uh, 90s with the new dispensation in South Africa. Uh, and many of them arrived different routes uh, on foods uh, uh, via Mozambique or uh, through the harbor, Durban Harbor. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then later on, of course, the direct fight of coming here as students or as uh, 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 expatriates. And there is a diversity in that. So, uh, uh, and many of them have continued to come rather as uh, refugees or asylum seekers, seekers. And here, I think I need to be very uh, specific about why I use migrant. And I use the word migrant despite knowing there are multiple legal uh, 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 status is uh, accorded to them, uh, the asylum seeker, uh, 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 expats, or uh, permanent residents, citizens, or respective of their legal status here, they continue to uh, interact with each other in a particular form and therefore uh, use the term migrant to uh, uh, put all of them together into a way. So, and Following this, I, I try to make sense of how they interact with each other, form a community, uh, identify themselves as, uh, uh, as migrants in South Africa. And here what I, what I have noticed is a, a very important ways of marking geography, uh, bodies and social spaces. And it starts from home, shops or restaurants that they own, 
they continue to portray this and speak uh, 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 about themselves, but at the same time also mark that particular geography yeah? uh, 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 through uh, different uh, symbols that they post. Uh, at home, for example, they would put uh, uh, the, if they're Christian, then they put, you know, the, uh, icons that would portray them as Christians and Muslims and similarly uh, to to, rec uh, to uh, uh, recapture that they are from Ethiopia, then they put uh, symbols that remind us of home, uh, pictures, paintings, uh, uh, different forms uh, are, are, are put together to represent uh, their identities. And the shops and the restaurant, the same way, uh, depending on who they uh, uh, serve. Uh, and the shops, they would see the Ethiopian uh, scripture, which is particularly Amharic or uh, scripture, uh, uh, and all the adverts would be trying to capture uh, 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 the attention of their particular customers. But in this case, what they're creating is they, uh, they, 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 they're creating marked geographies. Yeah? And this is where Ethiopians are residing. So wherever walking past, we'll just start to identify that area as a marked geography. And here, particularly the beginning of uh, Waste Street uh, in Durban, uh, which is now uh, called uh, Do uh, Dr. Bixley uh, Kasami Street, uh, you would vi vividly identify if you know a little bit about Ethiopia, that this is where uh, Ethiopians are residing, or those are shops run by Ethiopians. And uh, locals are already recognizing that and seeing this, uh, this is where Ethiopians are. Uh, prior to the beginning of uh, 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 occupying uh, the, uh, uh, the beginning of West Street, there used to be at Albert Park area. And uh, those movements uh, are facilitated as uh, by, by economic factors and other social relations. Uh, for example, renting a place is very difficult for some, so they depend on their social network uh, who has access to them. Of, and most importantly, they depend on the uh, uh, internal network, which is an Ethiopian network. Now, I keep mentioning Ethiopian, Ethiopian, but then you will see that there are uh, subtle differences and differences are, uh, 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 that may not be visible to outsider, but from it, as an insider, then you would be able to see it. And it's in, in a very interesting uh, uh, way, they continue to represent themselves in conversations as well, not only by marking geographies, but also in, in conversations, uh, narratives that they, uh, they, uh, they, they uh, 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 project. Uh, we are all Africans. Is he one of us? If only you were one of us, are you Habesha? I don't want to live at Waisa Street it's because it's full of Kambata and Hadiya. Kambata and Hadiya are ethnic groups uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, uh, why don't you give me a decent discount? As it, as it was, we were said to be children of the same country. Uh, it's a, a trying to bargain uh, 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 with, with a, a, a trader, a wholesaler. And I'm sure you know that the price I'm giving you is for kin and kin, and uh, the, the shop owner would reply. And in other moments, then the, the, you would you would notice that, uh, uh, and and, and uh, my countryman uh, is projected. An ethnic group is also being mentioned regularly, and a person would shift from one to the other within a space of a day, uh, uh, if not. Uh, weeks uh, and months. And those are the ways in which they try to facilitate their interaction. Yeah? Uh, but we also notice that uh, this shop is bought by an Ethiopian uh, from an Indian businessman. An Ethiopian owns this bar. Yeah? Let's go and support one of our own. Aren't we from the same country? Well, my countrymen. All those are very interesting ways of capturing self and others. And in that way, then one, uh, one is uh, uh, moving between different identities and facilitate that interaction. And here, uh, 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 what you notice is that the, the common feature of uh, uh, their conversation interaction with, the, with each other. Uh, and they continue to shift with moments and, moment, uh, 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 and movements. Uh, for example, if one is in Ethiopia, you wouldn't call himself as an African. But here, you know, I'm a migrant, I'm a refugee, or I'm 
uh, I'm an African would be something to uh, 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 something very much relevant. But it also depends who that person is interacting with. Why am I raising all this? They're very important to uh, 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 considering inclusion and exclusion. Who is in and who is out? Who should uh, 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 be uh, afforded some sympathy, support, uh, and who shouldn't? Who should earn uh, 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 our who should earn uh, our, our uh, uh, trust and who shouldn't is very much determined through those processes and, uh, uh, and through those uh, uh, narratives that they, they project. And, and we also notice that uh, uh, ethnicized discourses as well, yeah, Kambata, Hadiya, uh, and ethnicized spaces uh, as produced in transnational uh, 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 as a transnational production, yeah? So them versus, us versus them is often uh, a part of this arrangement. Associations that they establish with uh, uh, what they call Mahabha or Idr is a, a support uh, group for uh, uh, the, uh, in the time of date, and Mahabha is a, a saving uh, a group, and all are organized around ethnic identities and uh, uh, or identity markers uh, of a different kind. Perhaps it could be, it could transcend the ethnic. Uh, for example, people, uh, uh, those who come from uh, a particular a person it would then add this, would, would come together despite the fact that they uh, come from different ethnic background. Uh, but this is basically something that exclude others. Uh, they won't be trusted. Uh, but at the moments they will try to use the Ethiopian identity to earn trust or to negotiate a different kind of a social and material relation with the other. Uh, what do we learn from this? And what I picked up from here is sameness and difference are playfully appropriated and exploited in, in moments and movements. And the uh, 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 significance of one particular story, a narrative about self and others, as selectively uh, uh, mobilized to particular forms of uh, 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 using particular forms of uh, asserting similarity or difference. Uh, when they fight in, they, they emphasize on the difference. When they try to reconcile, they emphasize on a sameness. And uh, in, 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 for example, uh, uh, in, in a particular uh, incident that the, the Somali and an Ethiopian fought. Uh, over uh, 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 thoughts of a business dispute. And uh, elders came together and the, the, the narratives that they give to reconcile them is, you know, we are all from the same region. Yeah? We are all migrants. Yeah? Uh, and in another moment, uh, you would hear that you, we're all Christians. Uh, and they are very useful to facilitating actions of uh, uh, each individual or group. Uh, but it's also very important to recognize at this point that uh, those narratives are not all accessible to everybody. For example, uh, those who come from a rural area may not uh, 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 mobilize. Uh, being an African is a particular claim making in relation to South Africans. I'm entitled to live in this place. Or using that uh, uh, Ethiopia assisted the uh, 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 South Africans in their fight against apartheid uh, is not something that will be accessible to everybody. Uh, uh, but uh, those who have access to it would mobilize that. And it's also very important to recognize that some narratives are pushed by those in power. Local elites facilitate that. Why? Because there is so much uh, to retain, uh, to gain from that. Uh, to exclude others in controlling that particular group and any kind of benefit, uh, whether it's through trust or savings uh, 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 and material relations or uh, customer relationship uh, to be established through those networks. So the, the, the local elites then try to use that to uh, uh, strengthen bond uh, 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 within a particular group so that in, uh, other elites would be excluded from that. This is within 
different ethnic groups or religious groups within the Ethiopian community. But as I say that th this uh, 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 kind of relations uh, may not tell us uh, uh, there is a solid community uh, uh, which we can refer as Ethiopian community. Rather, what we see is communities uh, uh, operating at a different level uh, 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 and organized by a different interests. And we also notice that those are full of contradictions, uh, tensions, and anxieties as they promote uh, one uh, uh, particular narrative of sameness uh, or uh, uh, difference. Uh, uh, they, they don't see those contradictions and uh, uh, but uh, in their practices you see the attentions and anxieties and those are directly lent uh, themselves to uh, uh, the desire to fit in uh, to bring in there and uh, here together home and abroad uh, are part of those strategies and to conclude uh, we tend to see uh, uh, this as, uh, 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 as a very important way of, uh, the very important way of organizing uh, uh, self and organizing others in relate, uh, uh, and mobilizing uh, 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 narratives of sameness and difference as a strategy uh, 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 by those in power. And uh, from below, we tend to see that individuals are celebrating it and mobilizing it to facilitate their interaction and making this notion of integration a very problematic one. And uh, I leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Binyam. Really fascinating. Um, maybe if we have a chance in a, if I can snatch a few moments to, um, to comment a bit more on this work because it's quite, it links quite well with some work that I'm involved in as well. Um, but now, without further ado, we uh, will um, turn to our final speaker, um, who is Onyekachi Wambu. Um, Onyekachi is, as I mentioned earlier, the executive director of the African Foundation for Development, excuse me from my brain freeze at the beginning, um, which is a charity that seeks to enhance the, the contributions that Africans in the diaspora make to African development, Africa's development. Uh, it's, Afford is a pioneer and an innovator in the field of policy and practice of diaspora development, if you like, um, and responding to the disjuncture between the mainstream international development and actual diaspora action. Uh, and we at the Center of African Studies at SOAS have worked really closely with Afford for many, many years. Afford's advocacy work uh, under Onyukachi's leadership has contributed to UK and international recognition of the role of diaspora in African and international development and in the subsequent initiation of new policies, programs, funds and schemes by such global institutions as the European Union, the African Union, uh, DFID, now known as the FCDO, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, the World Bank, IOM, Comic Relief, GIZ and the Swiss Development Cooperate, Co Corporation. Onyukachi is a journalist by, um, by training and by many years, many years previously. Um, he's also written widely on Africa and her global diaspora, including a publication called Under the Tree of Talking, Leadership for Change in Africa, an edited volume, and Empire Windrush, 50 Years of Writing About Black Britain. So please, uh, Onyukachi, over to you. He's going to speak, uh, sorry, I should say, going to speak about remembrance, restitution, and the 10 Rs processing the past and increasing cultural understanding of legacies and enslavement and colonialism in the African world. Thanks, Onyukachi. Thank you, Laura, um, for that fulsome introduction. And also thank you to um, SOAS and, and the University of KwaZulu um, for the opportunity to share my thoughts on this. Um, about, um, 1988, um, 89, we started to notice um, a lot of increased interest and um, actions by the diaspora um, about issues of slavery and issues of um, remembrance. And, and it was really interesting that that interest and urgency has been picking up. I mean, there've always been 
a series of uh, connected movements led by Africans in the diaspora and on the continent um, in response to the economic, social, cultural, and spiritual leg legacies of enslavement and co uh, colonialism. But as I say, around 88, um, this interest um, was heightened. And I'm going to try and explain why I think it, it happened and why we are currently in a period of um, profound reckoning um, that will um, actually be, you know, I think going to, going to be with us for a considerable period of time. Um, as I said, the struggles took on urgency in the late uh, 1980s. And by 1992, the Organization for African Unity had established a reparations committee uh, and it appointed an eminent persons group to address wide ranging issues around reparations. Um, so this theme of head was building up amongst the ESPA groups. And in the UK, it included the launch of Bernie Grant, a uh, former MP, a uh, very respected MP, who launched an African reparations movement uh, in the UK. Um, and the movement began to seek reparations from the British government, but also uh, began to focus on issues of restitution of cultural artifacts as well in British museums. And indeed some demonstrations were held outside the British Museum to that effect. Uh, but at that stage uh, in those conversations, I actually attended one of those demonstrations. Um, you know, I think the people in the museum sort of looks on, on us with uh, mild um, uh, amusement um, at the time. Um, around the same time that Bernie uh, Grant was launching the African reparations movement, I was thinking about a uh, um, launching an African Remembrance Day, which would uh, ceremony, which would really commemorate the victims of enslavement. Um, I, I was aware that there was nothing that was being done um, despite the millions who had perished crossing in, in capture on the continent, crossing across uh, the Atlantic Ocean and, and also uh, on the plantation eco economies of the new world. Um, so that was um, on the cards in terms of thinking about that. That day was eventually launched in 1995, um, but it was a historical development in South Africa in 94 that I think really explains what was happening around this and why this head of steam, so to speak, was building up. And that development in 94 was obviously the election of Nelson Mandela, South Africa's um, president. Um, and it, for me, finally explained what was happening. Uh, South Africa in 94 uh, signified the official end of an age in history. And I think what we are looking at here in terms of kind of contested spaces is, is also about contested histories or, or spaces in the historical sense. And I think what began, what happened with 94 was this uh, official end of an age in history which one could perhaps call the age um, of enslavement and constitutional second class citizenship as far as the African was concerned globally. So beginning in 1452, when Pope Nicholas uh, V issued his papal bull um, that authorized uh, that King Alfonso V of Portugal uh, mm -hmm. could initially reduce any Muslims or Saracens as they were called then and pagans and other unbelievers to uh, perpetual slavery. Um, a second ball was issued by uh, the Pope shortly after uh, the Romanus uh, Pontifex on January the 5th, 1455 um, to the same Alfonso and it extended uh, in this papal ball the Catholic nations of uh, European domination over the discovered lands during the age of discovery. And along with extending the, the ownership of these discovered lands, it sanctified the seizure of non-Christian lands and also encouraged the enslavement of natives, non-Christian peoples in Africa uh, and the new world. So uh, I'm marking this period of um, 
enslavement and constitutional second class citizenship, as well as impacts the African and obviously the diaspora have their very intense uh, perceptions of this, having gone through uh, that process um, to this moment. So the age of discovery, empire, conquest and colonization for Europe uh, becomes the age of dispossession, slavery, occupation, um, and second-class citizenship for Africans. Uh, during this period, of course, um, there were there was always um, resistance um, as that was happening. Um, but what I think marks this period out is that uh, constitutions and laws in different countries around the globe but especially in the Atlantic space, what I'm calling the Atlantic space, um, enshrined African inferiority. Um, so the resistance battles and, free, and wars of freedom and liberation and decolonization were waged in different locations where Africans were to reverse these laws um, and chart a course for freedom. Um, the first measure of freedom was of course achieved in Eight, eight, on a scale was achieved in 1804 in Haiti uh, and then bookended by the final liberation in South Africa um, 190 years later. So South Africa ends this period of global and constitutional inferiority of Africans globally. Uh, and I think you can see what was happening in the African world is that from the moments of the papal bull, what people have been engaged in is actually pushing forward to remove each indignity in terms of the different locations that we've been um, uh, where Africans were. So Haiti, and then you, you have the battles uh, in America, you have the, uh, the battles within the, the British system uh, that leads to um, the end of slavery and then in Brazil, in all the different locations. And then we're into a, a decolonization battle. So each time we're looking forward, trying to remove um, the next indignity. And then it ends in, I think in, 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 in 1994. Um, and then we, what happens in 1994 is that um, we begin to look backwards at what happened uh, who were the victims? Um, you know, what, what other roles did we play in terms of reforming this Atlantic space? So during this period, a number of discrete but related campaigns have been waging resistance in, involving what I'm now characterizing as, as the 10 Rs, uh, recognition, remembrance, restoration, restitution, reparations, reconciliation, return, and reimagination, renewal and reconstruction. And the diaspora have played uh, very important roles in, in, in the sites of those struggles. Um, and it seems to me that the 10 Rs are a part of the reckoning now by the black and African world of the damaging impact uh, and the structural legacies of slavery and colonization. They frequently, the 10 has been, uh, have frequently developed uh, as us, uh, organizations and movements that have been nuanced around one of those hours. Um, but often um, they work as a continuum of a broader movement. As I said, Bernie Grant would take on the issue of reparations, but he would also address issues of restitution uh, of, um, of the artifacts. But each of those move, uh, R's, I would argue, is nuanced and, um, and, and complex in itself, but obviously the whole is to really um, tackle and respond to this, the, this legacy that uh, we have in terms of the age of um, second class citizenship and, um, and, uh, uh, and slavery. So if we go through the R's just in a little bit more, uh, the first was just recognition and acknowledgement of what had happened during this period. And we're still finding that very difficult when we engage um, different uh, sectors of, um, of, of, of 
empire or, or, or the old imperial order where you know the, the cultural world wars that are now being launched against the national English national heritage or even trying to uh, write about the fact that a lot of these uh, older buildings were built on slavery or the, or, or, or the results of, race, uh, of slavery. It's that issue of recognition of what happened is still <laughs> an acknowledgement is still uh, you know, with us uh, and a lot of people who are launched, as I said, in, in terms of the current government launching culture wars to prevent um, that recognition. Then we have the remembrance of the victims. Now at the most conservative estimate, crossing the Atlantic, there's 2 million people uh, uh, said to have died. Others uh, give much larger uh, projections of that figure. So you, you have these numbers of people who, who left the, the earth and there's been very little. I mean, before we started the memorial in the UK in 1995, there was nothing said about that number of people who could leave the earth and, um, uh, and nothing be said about them, you know, fathers, mothers, children, uh, children, daughters, um, perished and, and, uh, and not a word. So the remembrance of the victims and, um, you know, and those on the African continent and those on the plantations, and as I said, those in the middle passage, it, it has been very important. And then kind of this issue of restitution of physical artifacts and human remains. Um, you know, a lot of human remains were taken, some as trophies. Um, the Zimbabweans are still fighting to get the heads of um, of some of the first uh, uh, heroes in the first wars of liberation, which uh, were taken uh, and are stored somewhere um, in in a in a in a box in the basement somewhere. Uh, we believe in the VNA. So the, these issues of uh, restitution, the restoration of African dignity, and then reparations for the financial and other psychological. Uh, impacts of what happened, um, you know, as people always say, you know, well, why, why make the argument for reparations? And I said, well, if it wasn't about money, then cutting millions of people across the Atlantic was just a form of sadism. So it's either about money or sadism. And if it's about money, let's have a conversation, conversation about how you compensate the descendants of those who, who went through that atrocious experience. Um, and then there's been the issues that, um, again, within the African world, because there was an incredible severe breach and uh, um, of relationships. So there's issues around re reconciliation um, within this severed African world and how we deal with that. And then others like the Rastas and uh, have led a, a big movement for return, um, which is the, the, the most powerful form of reconnection. And, um, uh, and now there is, again, another movement um, to, to return. I, I understand in the last couple of weeks, Stevie Wonder made some uh, noises about moving back to Ghana. So that's all, again, uh, back on, on the agenda in a big way. And then we're now into also, how do we reimagine, how do we renew and reconstruct um, these shattered African societies uh, or, in terms of that last uh, characterization, the uh, um, African Union will see it as a renaissance. Um, and this is how it describes it in its agenda, uh, 2063. So we are at the beginning of this period of reckoning. It's likely to be a period of intense focus on different aspects of the three R's. Um, the Black Lives Matter movements last year, for instance, again, brought this back. Um, uh, and the issues of recognition were to the forefront. Who were these people with uh, who we are venerating our public squares? Um, why is it that these statues are still up? So e each of these movements throws up these bigger questions. And I, I think at heart, what we're tr seeing is a reinsertion of the missing narrative of the African participation in the creation of the Atlantic civilizational space. Uh, this space un unleashed by Columbus has been, uh, if not the most important geopolitical reality of the last 500 years. Um, the gold, land, and free labor of the conquered and the enslaved transformed the fortunes of the European world. 
turning small and medium sized countries into superpowers. People of African descent uh, played critical roles in co-creating this civilizational space over the last 100 years, but have rarely enjoyed the benefits and have indeed even been written out of the narrative of how that space was created. So the 10 R's are a reassertion of that African narrative of co-creation. Um, the victims are being remembered and spoken about. Requests are being made for artifacts and human remains and icons um, who were taken during that period. Uh, statues of, of cruel oppressors are once more in the frames as we try and uh, acknowledge what happened. Decolonization of texts, institutions, all of these are on the agenda uh, as African contributions and African contributions have been um, excavated and added to the corpus of knowledge. History and the future, I think, is being reborn. And to quote a title of Chinua Achebe's, it is morning yet on creation day. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Onikachi. Um, it's really interesting. I think the, the ways in which these three contributions um, contribute to our thinking about how history is made and how it's remembered and remade, I guess, um, in terms of, uh, and, and, and well, remade and also marked and, and uh, commemorated in it. So it's which voices are, are remembered and which voices are um, obscured and our kind of constant quest and all of this is to try to uh, bring out the voices that are being obscured. Uh, maybe that's a thread that seems to link all three of these contributions and although they take different um, perspectives. Um, so yeah, so, so I think there's, there's a lot here to um, get our get our wrap our heads around. Um, Angelica asked me if I would just at the beginning um, uh, say a little bit about the work that I'm doing, which maybe I was just thinking of um, some work that I'm involved in that uh, relates a bit particularly to Tibinium's contribution, but but not only. Um, so I'm involved in something called the migrating migration uh, for uh, development and equality, inequality, migration. I can't even, my brain's freezing again. It's called the MIDEC hub. Um, it's looking at migration and inequalities in the context of movements between so-called Southern countries, which is a terrible term to use. But one of the corridors that we're, we look at kind of para, um, uh, pairs of countries. And one of them that I'm working on particularly is, is Ethiopia to South Africa. So I was interested in thinking about the ways in which um, in these kinds of, in these contributions, um, the, the notion of community, of who belongs to a community, of, ha of having multiple communities, or communities that adhere in certain contexts and fragment in other contexts um, becomes relevant. So one of the things we're looking at is, um, you know, what is the experience of people as they move from Ethiopia to South Africa and how, what is their experience? of arriving, but also then how does that relate to inequalities between themselves and their original communities as well as themselves and their communities in which they've, they've settled in, in South Africa. And we're working with the University of Cape Town with uh, Faisal Garba and uh, Johannes Seifu and others. Um, and, and in that, I think that the, 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 some of the points that Binny made about uh, multiple communities really rings true for sure. But also I think Kapana's um, comments on mobility and immobility and the ways in which people's um, movements are cons conscripted, conscripted, restricted by their access to power, by their own, um, agency, which, which is some, in some ways determined by uh, forces outside of them is, is really relevant here. Um, and, and I think as well kind of links in some ways to the thinking about um, sort of how, how do we, or I guess I've been thinking a lot about how do we write this history? This is a, an important moment in the history of, of some Ethiopian communities and, and some South African communities and how are migrants and people on the move being worked into those understandings of history is, is really uh, kind of an interesting point. Um, 
I won't go into more detail on my own uh, research, but I'm, I'm fascinated by all of these different contributions. We have quite a number of um, questions that have already been entered uh, into the um, Q&A box. And if you have others, please, I would encourage you to um, put them in. Um, and uh, I will, I'm, unfortunately, I can't, we can't unmute you to ask your own question. I would have preferred that you would ask your own questions. and. Uh, we could have more of a, a real dis kind of live discussion, but since we're not able to, I'm going to have to read some of these questions. I, I hope that's all right. Um, and the first one, so maybe I'll take three, I'll take a round of three and then um, I'll come back and we'll do another round after as well. So we can try to keep it as much as, as if we were in the room together as possible. So the first question comes from Daniela Atanasova uh, for um, Kalpana saying, thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, in the title and abstract of your talk, you use the term migration, while in the talk itself, you often use the terms mobility and immobility when speaking about the movements of women to Natal. Could you please comment on this choice of terms and concepts? And then based on what you learned from your sources, how successful do you think they were, or how do you successful do you think colonial and traditional authorities were in stymieing the mobility of African women? And thirdly, I guess, when did those efforts to control mobility end? So that's one set of questions. And, and Kalpana, if you've not kept track, if, you, if it's hard to keep track of all the different strands of that three-part question, you can look in the Q&A. Um, and then another question for uh, Biniam from Samson Sagai. Um, is there so-called Ethiopian identity? And if so, what are its characteristics? Um, Samson's asking that, he says, he, I'm assuming that Ethiopia is a country of more than 80 ethnicities and mostly people think across ethnic lines, although I suppose you'd have something particular to say on that, Biniam. Um, and then I'm going to go down. We haven't yet got questions for Onikachi probably because these came in while uh, the others were speaking. Um, so I'm going to then take another question here around, well, that's around uh, Lubna's questions. <laughs> reparations for the suffering and pain experienced by indentured Indian women as well as other enslaved women within the context of forced migration to the various British colonies and particularly Port Natal. So let's take those questions and then we'll come back and um, Kalpana do you want to go first? Yes um, I'll go first. I'll look at the first question. Um, Yes, I do use the term migration. So perhaps a very simplistic um, deconstruction or rather understanding of uh, migration would be just the movements of people. But as I said in the introduction of my paper, it's a very much looking at from a local and an international perspective. So, you know, looking at how um, women immigrants from Britain, India, and, um, you know, came to South Africa and also looking at um, migration from the local context, so looking at African urbanization, so kind of juxtaposing the, the, the transnational migration with, within and local migration within the kind of framework. So in what ways, perhaps, and I'm trying to understand and explore, in what ways are, the, are these transnational migrations or um, local migrations, in what way are they, in a sense, um, similar or dissimilar? And if so, how and why? And um, we need not see it within, in an isolation. So, and I think when we, 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 we engage in a much more comparative, uh, uh, within a, um, analysis within a comparative framework, we tend to understand, um, you know, how ways in which, for example, race, class, and ethnicity interweave to shape the destinies and the histories of these particular individuals. Um, then there was the question on mobility. Yes, uh, the mobility that I was alluding to in the paper, I referred to within a much within a contextual use of mobility. And here I referred to the kind of um, you know agency of women more in terms of the um, the um, the personal mobility of these indiv of individuals. Um, so. Uh, towards the end of the paper, I alluded to how, for example, indentured Indian women had certain limitations um, and in terms of their mobility. So the 1895 three pound tax that prevented them, um, you know, they had to pay the three pound tax. Um, otherwise, they had to pay a fine or, or be imprisoned if they did not re-indenture. 
then also the issue of the uh, passes um, where African women in, for example, in Bloemfontein um, had to carry passes um, uh, and this kind of stand their, their, their personal uh, mobility. Um, so what I'm trying to allude to here is that um, and this has a serious impact on, on, the, on women in terms of the, uh, the kind of legislations that were introduced, attempted to, it was not only attacked on their, uh, for example, their livelihood, but it was an attack on their dignity as individuals, it's an affront on, the, uh, on their dignity. So um, um, in a sense, it, it kind of um, uh, had a huge impact on their personal, uh, on their kind of personal identities and their personal agency, uh, personal uh, movement. The other, just to add to that particular question also was to what extent were they successful? If we look, uh, sorry, colonial and uh, um, authorities were successful, I think, in limiting the movements of individuals. Let me just add that at the turn of the century, you know, following the 1913 uh, anti uh, past campaigns in Bloemfontein and the 1913 Satyagraha campaign, um, you would find that um, um, despite the resistance of the, these communities, I mean, legislation still continued. Um, so particularly with, um, for example, in the, in, in the uh, early 1920s, like you had the 1923 Urban Areas Act, which, which established segregated locations or townships within Afri uh, for Africans within the cities. And then um, the authorities constantly tried to introduce legislation that would limit the, 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 the entry or the mobility of women within the urban area. So it made it extremely difficult for them to actually to you know, acquire um, accommodation in the cities or employment, et cetera. They were only allowed to be there for a couple of months or hours, et cetera, and they needed a pass. And even then, um, for example, um, it, this, sorry, it had a huge impact on the overall um, mobility. Um, and, and then over a period of time, by the 1940s, you would find that more and more um, uh, African, uh, urbanization kind of increased by the 1940s. Um, and also, I just want to add that um, by the 1930s and early 40s, you, we see more, for example, protests and unrest by women, uh, particularly in Furinakung, in many of the various East Rand towns. Um, there were, for example, uh, police raids against women beer, beer, beer brewing. Um, in Potchestam, the municipality falling for example, imposed lodges permits as a means of controlling those who wish to live in the locations. So what is important here to also understand is that the, 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 the 1930s and 1940s, you had women being part, you know, seeing these legislation as an affront to their personal mobility, to their dignity, to their livelihood. And so what, what we see emerging is a kind of a political consciousness emerging during this period. And it actually uh, um, matures in a sense uh, within a multiracial framework in the 1950s, particularly with the formation of the Federation of South African Women. So I'll just stop there. There are other questions. Perfect, thank you so much, um, Kapana. We'll come back for, for more questions in a few minutes. Uh, Biniam, do you want to take the, the the question around uh, a so-called Ethiopian identity. And I, if I could, I would just maybe um, combine that with a second question from Fikadu Abito, who asks, um, can you please give us specific instances when Ethiopians in South Africa think themselves as Ethiopian and not as African, uh, and the implication that this thinking has on their integration within the wider South African population in Durban. I think the two questions kind of go together quite well, hopefully. No, they don't. Thank you, Laura. Uh, yes, uh, I think it's very true that Ethiopia is a very diverse country. Uh, 80, uh, uh, over 80 ethnic groups uh, do live in Ethiopia, but uh, uh, it's very important also to recognize that uh, the narratives that I capture is how they represent themselves, how, how they talk about themselves yeah? uh, in their conversation with others or in their, in their conversation with me. Uh, uh, as an Eritrean, uh, they would talk to me, uh, we come from that same area, same neighborhood as a Somali, 
you're Somali, I'm an Ethiopian, but we come from the same neighborhood. So that's how you identify uh, uh, how they, uh, uh, they, they represent themselves as an Ethiopian. It also goes beyond that. The, uh, they, they mark their homes with their flags or uh, Ethiopian uh, map or uh, artifacts from Ethiopia. So when you go into the restaurant, even though it is owned by one person from a particular ethnic group, it could be marked with a whole lot of Ethiopian uh, 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 symbols, yeah? symbols from Ethiopia, whether it's a, 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 a painting uh, that, that, is re that represents uh, Ethiopia. Uh, it could be a cultural art artifact from its particular ethnic group, but the, those are blended and they represent that this is an Ethiopian space. Yeah? Uh, an Ethiopian restaurant. And, and that's how you try to make sense of how they, uh, uh, they capture themselves. So, and their, and their claim making strategy and tactics, they move in, in and out of those categories. They're not always fixed Ethiopians. They're not always fixed uh, a particular ethnic group or Kambata Hadiya. Depending on who they're talking to, depending on who they're relating to, and depending on who they are engaging with, they move in and out of those categories. Uh, uh, and it's very important to recognize that local elites uh, from, uh, let's say from uh, a Hadiya ethnic group, they would organize an, uh, what they call it, uh, you know, this association to support in, in case of uh, bereavement and death. And there is a material element to it, uh, the money to be collected, money to be managed, dispersed depending on uh, 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 the particular situation. So they will be in charge of this. So whoever is going to come in, they monitor and regulate uh, uh, based on ethnicity. But in other instance, they mobilize an Ethiopian identity in order to have access to, uh, let's say, NGOs. Yeah? So we are representatives of Ethiopians and as they approach the uh, 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 local NGOs who are trying to support uh, 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 refugees and asylum seekers. So depending on the moments, they are moving in and out of those categories. So, so they're not fixed. Uh, and, uh, and African identity is also mobilized in a similar fashion. Yeah? They're not always fixedly African, but when they're speaking to somebody, a local one, a Zulu person, they would make a claim that uh, we are all African. Why? We need to engage with each other. We need to relate to each other as one because we belong to this continent. It's a, it's a claim making a strategy uh, uh, and it's a claim making a tactic. But then they, they're not co constantly fixed. You know, one day they move from one to the other, they move from one to the other, depending on who they're interacting with. So what I'm trying to claim is that they, those facilitate interactions with different groups and uh, different individuals from different backgrounds as they engage with each other. And the geographies that they mark, uh, 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 it's very important. And sometimes they use the South African flag to represent that they are in South Africa, or when they want South Africans to come in or use a South African name to their shop, if they are eager to attract local customers, yeah? Uh, uh, many of them, do, you know, are in, in, uh, running small shops, faster shops, and they, they, use the, those local names in order to attract customers. So they play this sameness and difference. They play uh, 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 in such uh, 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 intricate fashion, but they are not, they're very fleeting, undetermined always in their everyday interaction with, uh, the, uh, with, with others. And I think uh, I should leave it there. Thanks so much. We'll come back to you in a few minutes. Um, Onyukacha, I have a question for you, uh, which is um, it's around the sort of your position of kind of brokering conversations between diaspora and African-based communities. And I wondered whether in simulating these discussions, um, whether there are challenges in terms of different historical readings, different ideas, different expectations, of how people think that memorization and commemoration should take place, and if so, how do you how do you manage those? Um, how do you respond to those? So um, that's a, a question uh, for you. And then um, there are there are actually two questions here for 
Viniam, I must confess, I'm not entirely sure that I understand this question. So I'm going to read it out. It's from Sonia um, Ab, and I'm going to ask her, <laughs> maybe she can type in any clarification if it's not clear to you, Viniam. So anyway, she asks, why are marked geographies important? Uh, do markings and artifact have immediate currency? Um, how, for example, how, what, and why? Um, and that's with respect. Uh, speaking from the perspective of Indigenous South African, uh, San and Khoi descendant communities that have been assimilated and disappeared and are now trying to reappear under the new democratic government. So I guess it's asking maybe if, about making a parallel between um, these different communities. And the second question is um, from Gracious M Mavisa um, about uh, trying to understand the, the sameness and difference, how sameness and difference is conceptualized um, is this within and among Ethiopians only, um, or also, uh, or is it also embracing sameness and difference in the interactions between Ethiopians and locals in terms of South Africans and, Dur and Durban? Um, so maybe you could take, uh, Benny, if you could take, Benny, if you could take those two questions and Onikachi, the other one. Onikachi, do you want to go first? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question um, and very complex in terms of the reactions. Um, when we started the Remembrance Day, people um, would come along and there is a moment when you, you go through and I had that moment and you realize um, that you go beyond statistics and you realize that the, the people at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean were people. And I watch a lot of these uh, Who Do You Think You Are programs. And every time there's a, somebody of African descent um, um, and they're from the Caribbean, eventually they will go back either to the museum or wherever the record is and, and see that log that traces their ancestor to the point where they arrive um, in, in the Americas. And, um, and then it's a, you know, there's no name, there's no personality, it just says, African. Uh, and I remember the newscaster Maura Stewart going through that. And on camera, you could see her up until then it had been, yes, yeah, she, she knew this would happen. Yes, yeah, she knew this moment was coming. But then when the moment comes, she goes through an extraordinary experience on camera. In fact, she breaks down and they cut the camera. And I've seen two or three others go through this moment. So when we started a remembrance day, people go through this moment. They, when it stops being statistics and it's about them, it's about human beings. Uh, and the responses are, are difficult. Um, and how you then have that conversation, because we are talking about the Atlantic space. So there's an African dimension of that. There's a European dimension. And then there's you know, the plantation economies. How you have that conversation in terms of that um, triangle is very difficult. So again, you've seen complex reactions when people make the pilgrimage to, to the castles, the slave, enslaved castles uh, on the coast of Ghana, and then they get there. And of course, they're going through this incredible moment. Uh, you want the world around you to stop, but just outside the castles, Ghanaians are getting on with trying to, in the markets, trying to <laughs> make a living. And they're like, this is too important for you to just be doing these ordinary things. And sometimes there's a kind of a, an anger that the broader society hasn't taken on the weight of what they're going through emotionally and, and what happened. Uh, and then, so alongside that, there are just also issues of how this past is thought, taught in schools, both on the continent and, and elsewhere. And, and, and that is really inadequate, um, I would say, um, and the reason the people around the castles sometimes don't have that sense of a, of a sacred space that those who are coming back have is that um, they just haven't, there isn't, it, the educational system hasn't enabled them to go through that process. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a difficult conversation. I remember a friend who took um, uh, his partner from the Caribbean back to um, a village in Nigeria and, and the person said where are you from and you know these are villages who've never left the village and they said well 
um, I'm from Jamaica. At that point, they didn't know where Jamaica was, so they just said, "Oh, America," you know. And and and, and then she felt, well, why don't you know where Jamaica is? <laughs> so there there is um, there's a lot of work to do in terms of the different kind of appreciations of what happened and uh, and the weight of uh, that people feel about that history once they understand it and then to get other people to also share the sense of, of the immensity and the weight of that. Okay, great. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I'm sure it has, it actually, I'm thinking it has lots of um, extensions to other kinds of, you know, as you well know from Ford's other work, you know, in terms of diaspora discussions across different diaspora groups and as well with communities that they're engaging with in, in Africa, wherever. So and, and just another yeah, point, I mean, Sorry? Even the village, just another point, even the village woman yeah. knew so much about Europe, mm. but not about those who left. Right. So it's still that dominant discourse is really with the European the center of it is still what we're trying, I think, to, to now uh, kind of uh, I think it's more than decenter. I think we're trying to actually um, put in place a, a, an accurate portrayal of that past and all the different uh, forces that were involved and all the different peoples who were involved in that. Mm. All right, well, thank you for the interesting. Um, Biniam. Yes, thanks, Laura. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I think to answer this particular question, uh, uh, I would I would try to just give you the one particular account. Uh, a home affairs had uh, a way uh, the, the refugee reception center had uh, translators from local communities yeah, of uh, each countries that are uh, uh, that they uh, uh, had to serve on a regular basis. So this is from back in two thousand and twelve. Yeah. And what has happened there was, uh, uh, though the Home Affairs recognize uh, those uh, translators as Ethiopians, they are divided along ethnic lines. Yeah? The, the, the it, local elites uh, who act as mediators between a state and institution and uh, uh, their uh, uh, so-called communities. So what, what, what they did was, uh, uh, they said uh, uh, a particular figure of money that they should charge to the, those uh, who are seeking their service, even though the service, those services are meant to be uh, for free. So what they do is they collect the money from those uh, asylum seekers for whom they, they fill in a form or trans, uh, act as translators. Uh, uh, and one particular person uh, uh, interjected and said, this is not acceptable. So he started to do it on his own and for free. And they tried to literally uh, harass him and uh, destroy him. And uh, what they did was now they start to mobilize their ethnic groups against this, this particular person. Don't go through him. Don't trust him. You know. Uh, so they, uh, uh, even though he's for free, and even though he would serve them well, uh, uh, they try to mobilize it along those ethnic lines. So when do they emphasize uh, narratives of sameness? When do they emphasize narrative of differences? what I am uh, very much uh, keen on and uh, try to un uh, understand and unpack. And they tend to mark geographies as well. The, this bar is owned by Ethiopia. It's no longer just a bar, it's a bar owned by an Ethiopian. So let's go and socialize there. This is a bar owned by a Kenyan, uh, one of us, yeah? Uh, one of us because we are now refugees or migrants in this unhospitable country, yeah? That doesn't like foreigners. Or you meet a Zulu person, you say that we are all the same, uh, you know, we are Africans, you know, and stand together. And it's a claim making strategy. Yeah? So they shift uh, uh, in moments and movements. And uh, that's what I try to appreciate uh, 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 and, and try to relate it to how those facilitate interaction, uh, uh, economic, social, and uh, 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 material engagement with within those communities and across communities as well, locals or other foreigners. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. We have one uh, additional question for Anyukachi here. 
uh, from Joe Davis saying, thank you for your brilliant contribution today. I sincerely hope that the efforts to gain reparation payments prevail. Um, I wonder, did you know that the National African American Reparations Commission yesterday called on President Biden to support reparations and HR 40 by any means necessary? Do you think uh, there's a place, or is there a place, one place where all the reparations proponents gathered to caucus and do you think it will work? And is the African Union, I guess, still involved in this? So set of, set of, set of questions, I guess. Well, at, at the African Union, the person who led the charge and financed it uh, was a former um, Nigerian presidential candidate, um, MK Oyola Biola. Um, and he was passionate about this issue and, and had the money to finance the uh, African Union to take it on at that level, which is why there's, he, he in fact financed the work of the eminent um, uh, persons group. Um, the African world have come together around the issues of reparations and the last, you know, we keep coming back to South Africa in all of this and the, um, the, the last time everybody came together was um, to put the case at um, the Durban conference on, on, on racism and uh, uh, where in, in the end they pushed through a uh, you know, the, the, the idea that uh, what happened in the Middle Passage and during slavery was a crime against humanity. So that was a major uh, push for a lot of momentum built up after that um, conference in Durban in 2001, um, in August, early September. And of course, all that momentum dissipated a few days later when the Twin Towers were hit and we had 911. So for about 10 years, uh, you know, um, New, new battles were being fought in, um, in, in the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, and there wasn't, uh, this just went off the agenda. In the last few years, uh, CARICOM in the Caribbean, um, the Car CARICOM countries have come together uh, and now have a, an agenda and they passed a resolution where they've asked the former European colonial powers um, who had uh, colonies in, in the, in the, the Caribbean region to, to make reparations. And those, um, you know, um, there's a, you know, at the University of West Indies, there's a uh, research um, uh, commission, commission there on reparations, which feeds into the Car CARICOM initiative. Uh, and the vice chancellor of the University of West Indies, Sir Hilary Beckles has been taking up a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the, a lot of the pressure to get recognition of this. Um, the University of West Indies signed an agreement recently with uh, Glasgow University, I think, uh, where there was going to be some form of uh, reparations because of the role of, the, of that university in, in the trade. Um, but yes, there hasn't been um, kind of widespread recognition uh, from uh, the, the parties on, on this side. Um, to, to do that um, and what when we were put in these arguments sometimes to uh, under the Blair government or others they wanted to talk instead uh, about how they were dealing with this legacy through the prism of development aid um, and, and that was how they wanted to have the conversation um, and dealing with it as development aid does not allow you to go through the process, I think, as South Africans went through, where you understand what happened and, and understand why it is that a conversation needs to be happened about, you know, you know what exactly happened, who benefited, the structural uh, inequalities and disparities that were put in place as a result. And then you can then work out a way that you think you might be able to uh, look at how you, uh, address uh, issues of compensation or issues of redress as I would prefer to, to call it. So um, I think those, you know, the conversations are going on the African side, the, at, at certainly at the elite level, at AU level, at the level of CARICOM, at the level of the Congressional Black Caucus, there's, there's, there have been a lot of conversations and, and common positions um, have been arrived at. And I, as I say, the most, uh, you know, really, uh, dramatic one was the common position that was arrived at before the Durban conference in 2001. 
Great, thank you. That's really helpful and interesting information. Um, we're just about out of time. So I just want to thank all of our speakers for a really rich and fascinating um, conversation around all sorts. We've covered a huge amount of, of um, different sort of subjects, but also different sort of um, perspectives, I think, bringing in history, bringing in identity, um, thinking forward to the future about how do we, how do we make, make sense of or make, come to some sense of, um, sense of reconciliation in terms of going into the future as well. So I really want to thank all of you for um, some fascinating conversations. I also um, wanted to draw people's attention to the fact that there's a keynote speech, which is going to start in about 15 minutes. Um, uh, our keynote conversation actually on archives, museums, and heritage as contested spaces of identity with Professor Paul Basu from SOAS and uh, Elsie Owusu, uh, who is an architect and director of Just Ghana LTD. So please do join that if you're able. And this, then later on after that will be another panel on archives, museums, and heritage as contested spaces of identity. So um, thank you so much to everyone here who's joined us. We've had a great crowd. Uh, and um, I hope that somehow we can uh, virtually clap our hands and, and say thank you to Kalpana, Biniam, and Onyakachi. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye.